It's really no surprise that kids love takeout food. It usually comes in colorful packaging, it's crunchy, and often it's pretty salty. It's okay to enjoy those things once in a while, but I find that sometimes make-at-home treat food can be a little bit healthier and just as appealing. Today I'm going to show you three great kid-approved recipes. the word nugget, most kids get excited because they just assume it's probably something like breaded chicken. Today I'm going to show you how to make cauliflower nuggets that are really delicious and if you don't tell the kids what they are, they'll probably inhale them without even blinking. So first up we're going to take our cauliflower which we've cut into little about one inch segments and we're going to just simply dip it in some beaten egg and some seasoned panko breadcrumbs. Panko are Japanese breadcrumbs and they are different than regular ones. They're sort of more like shards and they tend to stay a lot crispier when you bake with them. So that's why I really like using panko for something like this. I'll just give that a little stir. And it's a little bit messy to do this breading job but it's well worth it because it's so delicious. And this is again a great vegetarian option instead of say chicken nuggets that we talked about. So you see how easy it is to just dip and bread those. I try to do it with just one hand to keep one hand clean in case I need to reach for something. And if your kids don't mind the thought of eating cauliflower nuggets, this is a great recipe to make with them. They'll enjoy the dipping as long as they don't mind getting their hands dirty. And there's lots of different sauce possibilities. We're going to make a sweet uh, chili sauce that is a real favorite of lots of people. We're going to cook these up in the oven. They don't take too, too long to get crispy. But you can also make this recipe in an air fryer if you happen to have one. And if you don't know what an air fryer is, it's like a tabletop convection oven that blows hot, hot, hot air over the food that's sitting in a basket and cooks it in a little bit less time and with no oil needed for a lot of food. So you can make French fries, sweet potato fries, even uh, chicken nuggets, back to the chicken nuggets again, all without oil. Now with this recipe, with the cauliflower, we don't need oil either. The only downside of air fryers is that the baskets tend to have a limited capacity, so you can only make small batches. But they are a handy gadget if you have room for another gadget in your life. There we go. It just takes a few minutes to do this, but then you have time to make your sauce and even sit and rest and play a board game with the kids quickly while the nuggets are cooking. I find these are generally best eaten when they're freshly made. You can reheat them in the microwave, but they won't be quite as crisp as when they first come out of the oven. You can see how having a few sets of hands might make this job a little bit faster or a little bit messier, hard to say. When you're buying cauliflower in the store, look it over, if you can, through the plastic if it's wrapped and make sure that it doesn't have any black spots. That can be the beginning of a little bit of mold and once you get it home in your fridge, it can continue to turn black kind of quickly. So I take that extra minute and look mine over. We had a crisis where cauliflower ballooned in price a few years ago, but that seems to have subsided and now it's an affordable vegetable that you can find all late summer, fall and even into the winter. Go. And if your kids are the sort that would only eat something like this with ketchup, I'd say go ahead and do it. Doesn't really matter. You're getting them to eat vegetables. A little ketchup isn't going to hurt them. Last two pieces. There we go. So into the oven with this tray. Just wipe my hands off first and then we'll make our sauce while it's cooking. All right, so while our nuggets are getting cooked and crispy in the oven, we're gonna make our delicious dipping sauce. I'm gonna start with just a little bit of canola oil and my favorite ginger and garlic mixture. As I may have mentioned in the past, I love to grate up a whole lot of ginger and mince up some fresh garlic and mix up quite a bit of it. I probably do two cups at a time, spread it in a Ziploc bag and squeeze the air out and then I can just break off a piece every time I want some of this mixture. It's a combination I use a lot. 
All right, and then we're going to add some soy sauce. I'll simmer things down a little in that zippy pot. And then some sweet chili sauce. This is great because it's kind of got a little bit of heat and the sweet, as the name would suggest. And it's just a bit more interesting than plum sauce. If your kids are not big fans of heat, then you could just use regular plum sauce instead of the sweet chili sauce. So we'll add that in. There's lots of great dipping sauces out there that you can buy as well if your family has a favorite one. The Asian ones tend to be really great with cauliflower. Go ahead and use it. Now I'm just going to juice up this lime. We want about two tablespoons or so, which I think is what I've got there. And lime all over my hand. There, give this a stir. It's pretty straightforward. If you find you're using a lot of this sauce, you can make up a batch and keep it in the fridge for probably four or five days. Now we'll add in our lime juice. And then we just want to bring it barely to a boil. You don't want it scalding hot when you put it on the cauliflower, but you definitely want it warm. Give it a little bit more heat to get it up to the boil. You can see the little bits of the chilies in there, the peppers, and also I think they put a bit of carrot in it for some contrast. And then we've got our lime pulp. They say a watch pot never boils. Sometimes I find if you keep stirring, you can actually prevent something from coming to a boil because you're constantly displacing the hot liquid on the bottom. So I'll stop stirring for a minute, and sure enough, we've got the bubbles starting to form at the edge. Great, now that that's bubbling, it's all ready, and we'll just turn it off. It'll stay warm sitting there, and we'll wait for our cauliflower to be finished and then we can plate it and put the sauce on it. All right, we've got our golden crisp, beautiful looking cauliflower nuggets fresh out of the oven. They smell so good. And now we're just gonna put them on our serving plate and put our sauce on it. They're really, really nice and crispy. And it's the kind of thing that, uh, it's not just for the kids. I love eating these. They're a really fun thing to have for lunch. They'd be a fun um, snack to serve if you were having a party. You could even make up little bowls or baskets of hot cauliflower nuggets and uh, serve them that way for people with their own individual dipping sauces if they wanted. Maybe even a cauliflower nugget buffet with four or five different sauces. Usually in my family we just eat them right off the tray, but I'm doing it fancy for you guys today. All right. So now we're going to take our sauce. And you don't want to overdo it, just drizzle it on and then you can always have a bit more for dipping on the side. But it also makes them look a little bit more festive. I can smell the, the heat and the sweet in this sauce, it's just perfect. Another way to do this would be to transfer it to a measuring cup or a jug and then you could drizzle it a little more quickly, but I'm just trying to not overload it as I said. And then I'm going to put some more in this little container for dipping. And then we're going to dress it up. Once again, green onions, one of my favorites. They're so economical and they just look so pretty on so many dishes. All right and some sesame seeds for a little extra crunch and texture. And there we go, our crispy cauliflower nuggets are ready for you to dive in. I don't make fried chicken too often because we know fried foods are not the healthiest and I really don't like having my kitchen smelling of oil for a day or two afterwards. This baked version is a great alternative. It's easy and delivers all the tasty joy of fried chicken without the fuss or fat.
One of my favorite tips that I love to share with people is to freeze meat in marinade. This chicken's been in a buttermilk brine. It did its magic as it froze and continued as it thawed. Ziploc bags and a Sharpie marker, and you don't have to wait 12 hours to enjoy your favorite marinated meats anymore. Fried chicken is a favorite in my family, but I try not to make it too often because we don't need a lot of deep fried foods. I've come up with an alternative oven baked chicken that's just as good as fried, and I'm excited to share the recipe with you. First we're going to brine our chicken, and I like to make buttermilk the staple of the brine because it really helps to make the chicken nice and tender, but you don't have to buy buttermilk. You can just take regular milk, add in some vinegar, give it a stir. And you'll notice it starts to curdle or look a little bit curdled and that's pretty much what you're getting with buttermilk. The other thing I like to add in for a little flavor in my brine is some hot sauce. You can use your favorite Tabasco, whatever you like. I really like this Frank's Buffalo sauce. I didn't know that it's not crazy spicy hot. It's just got a beautiful sweet heat. So it's a real favorite of mine. So I'm going to stir that in. And then I've got my chicken breasts already in a Ziploc bag labeled. I often do a a few batches of these at a time and put them in the freezer and then it, whenever the fancy for oven baked fried chicken strikes we're all set to go. So just pour it in and as you seal it up squeeze the air out a little bit. It's easiest if you have it kind of lying down. There, I only made a tiny mess this time, pretty good. So there, now we have our chicken ready to go. This needs to sit in the fridge for about 12 hours or as I mentioned, you can put it in the freezer and to pull it out in a day, a week, a month and you're all ready to go. I've got some that has been brined. So we're gonna switch over to this batch. And the first thing we need to do is take it out of the brine before we can coat it to put it in the oven. So it's a little messy, but it's a good mess because it's a food mess. So just let the excess drip off as you pull the chicken breasts out. You can use this same method if you want to do uh, chicken drumsticks. You could use chicken thighs. I'll often take the boneless breasts and cut them into strips to make chicken tenders. And that's another real favorite in our house. There we go. I'm just going to give my fingers a wipe. And now the process to coat them, you have a lot of options, but today we're going to use corn chips. Panko is great, the Japanese breadcrumbs, cornflake crumbs are terrific as well, but there's something really magical about using corn chips. Today we're going to use a blend of Fritos and Doritos, just because those are two things that I think are awesome. And what we've done is put them in a Ziploc bag and then crush them with a rolling pin. They don't have to be super fine, having a little bit of texture is actually really fun. Both of these are gluten free. Almost every um, version of Doritos is also lactose free with exception of some of the toppings. So if that's important, you can check the labels or check on their websites. So we're just gonna put the crumbs here. Easy to dip the chicken in that way. We'll set the rest aside in case we need it. And then what you wanna do is have a baking rack lined with parchment for easy cleanup and a wire rack placed on top to lift the chicken up off the paper. And then very simply into the crumbs, press both sides. And you can always go back and sprinkle a few more crumbs on top once they're on the tray. So don't worry too much about how uniformly they're coated. This is a really great dish to make with teens who are getting interested in cooking because it's the kind of flavor that a lot of them really like and it will seem super fun to them. And it's pretty foolproof. Depending on the size of your chicken breast, you'll need to cook it anywhere from 35 to 55 minutes. We'll be using an instant read thermometer, like this one. To check the temperature, you want it to be in the 165 to 170 range in the thickest part of the chicken, and then you'll know that it's done. So I'm just going to add a little bit more. There we go. These have lots of flavor going on, but if you like things peppery, this is a good time to put a few grinds of pepper on if you wish. There, I think we're set. And the last thing you need to do before it goes in the oven is to drizzle some melted butter on top. So this mimics the frying and helps make the crust really crispy. And it takes just about two or three teaspoons per chicken breast, depending on the size.
There we go. Now we're going to slide this into the oven. It's set at 400 degrees and we'll let it uh, sit and maybe you can prepare some side dishes, a nice salad or some cut up vegetables, whatever your family likes. All right, our chicken's been in for about 47 minutes and it looks perfect to me. I love how the texture of the crumbs really shows up in the coating. We're just gonna check the temperature here. 171, that's perfect. It's really important to make sure you don't undercook your chicken. Anything below 165 really isn't safe, but also you don't want to overcook it or it's going to be tough and dry. If it's chicken on the bone, the areas near the bone are going to cook faster, so you need to cook to check the temperature perhaps a little bit sooner than you would with a boneless cut of meat. We're going to just transfer it to our serving plate. And if you want, this is also something fun to serve with dipping sauce a plum sauce, some more of the Frank's hot sauce, a blue cheese dip, really whatever you think your family would enjoy. Look how great these look. Guilt-free, almost fried chicken with a fun corn chip crust. I blame my Nova Scotia heritage for my love of all things ginger and molasses. It's a combination I use often in cookies, cakes, waffles, muffins, and more. These bars are squares, just depends on how you choose to cut them, are the perfect blend of cookie and cake and the candied ginger on top is a real treat. They're delicious on their own, but even more festive with a scoop of ice cream or a dollop of whipped cream. If you're making a festive meal that's gonna to appeal to your kids, of course you have to plan for dessert. In our house, all things molasses rule. Ginger cookies, gingerbread, we love them all probably because of my Nova Scotia heritage because I make them often. I've invented something new and it's a gingerbread cookie bar and I'm excited to share that with you today. We're gonna to make the batter, sprinkle some crystallized ginger on it, bake it up, and they'll be ready to eat as is or even better with some whipped cream or ice cream. To start, we're gonna put some sugar in our mixing bowl. You don't have to use a stand mixer for this, but it's helpful if you have it. So first we've put in brown sugar and now we're gonna add some white sugar. a Little bit of vanilla and some melted butter. This isn't piping hot, you wanna melt it and then let it cool for a few minutes. If it's too hot going in, when you add the eggs, they might start to cook and you don't want that to happen. So I'm just gonna pour this in. It may look like a lot of butter, but we're making a nine by 13 pan. So it's a pretty generous qu uh, quantity of recipe. We'll turn it on and blend those together. The only thing you want to watch for is to make sure there's no big lumps of brown sugar. Depending on the age of your sugar, it may have started to solidify. If that happens, stop it and use a spatula to crush the lumps. We're lump free today in here, which is great. Now we're going to add the eggs and I'd like to share a little trick with you and that's to not crack the eggs right into your bowl. And the reason I suggest that is if you happen to have some shell or the egg is bad, all of a sudden you've ruined the mixture or you've got to go dumpster diving for that bit of egg. So I always have another bowl to crack them into. And this is a great tip if you're teaching kids how to bake because that way they won't have problems putting eggs into mixtures. And it's really good to add them one at a time if you have the patience. I'm not always the most patient baker, but today I will be. While that's mixing, I'll crack the next one. And add it in. This is the stage where you want to mix the mixture more. It helps to incorporate air and make it light and fluffy. Once you've added the flour, for most recipes, you don't want to mix it as much. It's really just to make sure the dry ingredients are blended in. And there's our third egg. While that's, oh, and the last thing we need to add is some molasses, favorite ingredient. Give it one more little scrape here. There we go. All right, that's looking great. Now we're gonna combine our dry ingredients. So we have our flour here. We're gonna add in baking powder, some ginger, if you bake a lot, you may want to consider investing in some higher quality spices for the flavor. I buy mine from an online Canadian shop called Cardamom and Cloves, and the quality far surpasses what I can find in grocery stores or bulk stores. This ginger is so aromatic, I can smell it from here. 
And the reason that you're blending it in is just so that it's evenly distributed once the flour mixture gets into the butter mixture. Another tip with spices is to not buy them in huge quantities because they do lose their pungency. The only ones that last are seeds that have yet to be ground and those you can buy in a bigger quantity. So I'm going to pour about half of this in. Looks like about half. Give it a stir. And absolutely you can do this in a conventional mixing bowl. I just really like my stand mixer because it was a great way to increase my speed at baking and it was fun for my kids when they were learning because it's a lot easier when you're trying to mix a stiff dough like a chocolate chip cookie dough. And in with the rest. You need a little helping hand to get that out. There we go. And one more trip around the mixer and that's it. Our batter's made. This is another recipe that you could play around with. I've made it with uh, finely chopped pear in it and that was delicious. Cardamom, one of my favorite spices, is a natural match for molasses and ginger. You could easily put apple in. You could even lay the fruit slices in the bottom of the pan before you add the batter and then serve it upside down cake style and that'd be fun. With the stand mixer sometimes you'll find that there's a little bit of flour lurking in the edges. So I'm just going to give it a quick manual stir and then we're going to put it in our pan. I really don't fuss too much about lining my pans with parchment paper. It doesn't seem to make a difference whether you have perfectly folded corners or not. So don't uh, sweat it and just do it in the way you want. So the trick when you're putting the batter in is that you want to make sure it's fairly evenly distributed. It is pretty thick, like thicker than even a normal cake batter. And that's why this is kind of a cross between a cookie and a bar or a square. It's, it's just magical. And once we've emptied the bowl, then we can spread it around to make it even in the pan. I really like making squares or bars because I find they take a lot less time than cookies. Cookies can be tedious to portion out if you need to do a big quantity of baking, but with bars or squares you just <coughs> load up the pan and then depending on the size you choose to cut them in, you can have a whole lot of servings in a fraction of the time. Most bars and squares tend to lend themselves really well to freezing as well. All right, give that a little scrape. And the crowning touch for these is just a bit more ginger because who doesn't love ginger? It's supposed to be really good for the digestion as well. So we're going to add some crystallized ginger. Here's what it looks like. You can buy this in almost any grocery store or health food store and it's slices of ginger that have been dried and coated in sugar. And they're still pretty chewy. You can see that you can just bend them and break them. What I've done is I've minced them up pretty small and we'll just scatter them over the top as evenly as we can. And yes, I realize this adds more sugar to the recipe and that's okay. It's a dessert. It's a treat. You don't have to have it every day. This would be another great lunch box item for grown-ups or for kids. If you wanted really tall bars, you could spread this mixture in an 8 by 8 pan instead and you would just need to increase the cooking time to account for the depth. All right, there we go. So this is going to go into the oven for about 25 minutes and then when it comes out we'll let it cool and we'll cut it into our bars. All right, our gingerbread cookie bars are out of the oven and cooled and it's important to let them cool because they're a lot easier to slice that way. The reason I get, love parchment paper is not just the easy cleanup. Look how simple it is to lift them out of the pan. Perfectly clean pan. And then you can just fold the edges down to start cutting. Pro tip is to cut a tiny sliver off the edge and that's the cook's treat. That way everyone gets a nice crisp uniform edge in their piece. And I like to do this with a nice long knife. We'll cut some nice size little bars here. Put them on our plate and dessert will be served.
gingerbread cookie bars, the perfect finish to any meal. I hope you've learned from today's show that kid-friendly food can be flavorful and fun and doesn't have to be in a takeout box. From this crisp corn chip crusted chicken to beautiful cauliflower nuggets and gingerbread cookie bars, there's a whole lot of flavor and fun in this meal.